support comes from the Arizona Inn, a Four Diamond family-owned historic resort hotel and restaurant on Elm Street near the U of A. Information is at ArizonaInn.com. We going? Go. Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Nensel, the executive editor of the Tucson Weekly and Tucson Local Media. We're here to talk Zona politics. Joining me today, Tucson Weekly reporter Danielle Kamara and Arizona Daily Star reporter Joe Ferguson. Thanks to both of you for joining me today. Yeah. Thanks. So, Joe, let's start with Senator John McCain. Uh, you just came from his memorial service up in Phoenix. Tell us a little bit about what you saw there. A lot of people coming out to support John McCain. So we often hear about people who are upset with McCain, and today was a good example of why he's been reelected over and over again six times. Is that there is this dedication to him and his service and respect. People, Democrats, Republicans, both came out today. Football players. A lot of people came out to explain who he was, his service to the country, and to say goodbye to him one more time. And so it was kind of touching to be quite honest with you. And who were some of the speakers who were there? So we had Joe Biden, we had uh, Larry Fitzgerald, we had uh, Grant Woods, all talking about you know their relationship to him over the last 30 years. Well, I think uh, he certainly leaves a major legacy here in our state. Uh, you know, this was primary election week, so let's talk a little bit about what's going on there. We had a U.S. Senate race. Uh, now we have Southern Arizona's own Martha McSally, who's going to be taking on Kirsten Sinema, the congresswoman from Maricopa County. Uh, Joe, we've seen Sinema move to the center through the course of her political career, and we've seen Martha McSally kind of move from the center over to the right. And uh, what do you think the big issues in this campaign are going to be? Well, I th I'm going to guess that health care is going to be a big thing, the, the presidency. We're talking a lot about these kind of issues as we move forward in the midterms and what the Senate might look like. We're appointing a Supreme Court justice. And so I think there's a lot of people asking what the Senate will look like in November. What, what do they really want? Do they want you know a rubber stamp? Do they want a check on the powers of the presidency? And Arizona is front and center in that as we decide and elect our first uh, female senator. And so I think that's going to be huge in when we see on the campaign trail. And Danielle Martha McSally seems to have really invent, reinvented herself for this Senate run in, in terms of cozying up to Donald Trump. Yeah. So uh, pretty much when she started the primary, she was facing two candidates who were really to the right of her and were really critical of some of her uh, previous stances on immigration and other issues where they just didn't think she was uh, as in line with the president as they wanted her to be. And so that really pushed her to the right. Uh, you know, when Donald Trump won, she was really quiet about her feelings about him and since then, she's, you know, uh, talked about him in her campaign ads. She started using the phrase fake news. She pulled her support of a bill that would lead to citizenship for some DACA recipients. So she's really, it seems like this primary really pushed her to the right. And Joe, she's also uh, talking a lot about her military service and contrasting that with a photo of Kirsten Sinema protesting the war in a pink tutu. And Kirsten Sinema is pushing right back on it, talking about the bills that she has passed, her service in Congress, her service in the state legislature, her family's ties to the military. So I do expect a kind of a back and forth on this issue, although. I'm kind of hoping I'm, for myself that I'm not going to see the pink tutu for the next eight weeks. I, I, can, I think we can guarantee that you will see the pink tutu for the next eight weeks, probably about four million times between now and then. Uh, let's talk about the seat that McSally is giving up here in Southern Arizona's Congressional District 2. Uh, Ann Kirkpatrick uh, came out on top in this crowded Democratic primary. Mm -hmm. uh, Danielle, this race got particularly rough between Kirkpatrick and the second place finisher, yeah. uh, Matt Hines, who was uh, the previous nominee for this seat. That's right. Yeah, so, you know, Kirkpatrick started this race saying she didn't want it to be a divisive race, but Matt Hines just came out with uh, some attacks against her previous record of having some votes that had to do with protecting the Second Amendment, 
over gun regulation in particular, um, as well as some votes on environmental issues that uh, aren't really in line with kind of the more liberal side of the Democratic base. And she fought right back, and it was really a back and forth, uh, which led up to him comparing her run to saying that she wanted to win like a meth addict. And I think that that, you know, I can't say that that is why he lost, but I think that people were really critical of him saying that, especially considering that it was very obvious that he wanted to win very badly as well. And Joe uh, Kirkpatrick had the support of Gabby Giffords, of Ron Barber, the DCCC, a lot of Emily's establishment list. response, Emily's List, a lot of establishment response be behind Ann Kirkpatrick in this race. And that also turns and in, translates into money. You know, half a million dollars, by my estimate, flowed into this race from outside sources, Democrat on Democrat. It's not something you see when Emily's List comes in and buys a very large ad to attack another pro-choice Democrat in a primary. But in this case, uh, Matt Hines did not have the financial resources to counter any of these attacks. He put in a lot of money himself. He put in six figures to try to counter these kind of things. but. You know, some of that money was paid up front when he did things, including pay for a private eye to follow Anne around in that court challenge. That, so, I mean, that added to the, how nasty the fight got. And you covered Kirkpatrick when you were in Flagstaff working for the Arizona Daily Sun, uh, so you're familiar with her. What, what can you tell us about her? You know, I think Anne is probably best described as a blue dog prior to her Senate run. She was well known and well liked up in Flagstaff. She had good tribal relationships. She was pro gun rights. She walked around with those damn boots everywhere she went, and she had that kind of reputation. Um, she lost her seat, and when Gosar challenged her, she says it was because of her support for the ACA. I think there were a couple of other issues going on, but that, you know, really kind of explains who she was in terms of being a blue dog. But we're seeing another Ann Kirkpatrick, just like some other chameleons this year, where Ann's now coming out and saying, I don't support the guns the way I used to. When, what happened to Gabby, what happened in Newtown, seriously changed my perspective on it. I want an assault rifle ban. I want different things. And that's partially why we see her being supported by Giffords and her husband now. And Danielle, on the other side of this, uh, Leah Marquez-Peterson, the president of the Tucson Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, came out on top in mm -hmm. a four-way Republican primary, although it was kind of a narrow win for yeah. her, surprisingly, because yeah, she had a lot more money than the other ones did and a lot yeah. more name recognition. I'm surprised that it came that close, actually. Um, yeah, she narrowly won over Brandon Martin, um, who was uh, to the right of her, and um, yeah, I was surprised how close that came. Um, and, you know, I think that going forward, I think one of the big issues in this area, in this race, is going to be uh, border security and immigration. And uh, she's already been running ads that show her, you know, walking by the border wall, walking with Border Patrol agents. And in the primary run, that was something that Democrats were uh, very vocal about, feeling like the immigrant community is being attacked by this administration and really wanting accountability candidate who's going to stand up against that. It does seem like she's falling into Trump's, Leah Marquez-Peterson is falling into uh, kind of a Trumpian uh, mode here. I can't find a Republican that isn't falling into a Trumpian mode this cycle That's down true. here. Although I will say that, you know, the staple of being by the border wall is something we see with every candidate every two years, regardless of what side of the fence you're on, politically speaking. And uh, we noted Leah Marquez-Peterson was, was hard to track down during this primary race, Joe. Was that your experience as well? It was my experience. She dodged debates put up, organized by her own Republican Party. So I think maybe we should have the milk carton for Leah instead of the, somebody else. Uh, and let's talk about CD1 a little bit. This is that sprawling district that includes Oro Valley and Marana here in southern Arizona, and then eastern Arizona, all the way up Flagstaff, the northern uh, Arizona Indian reservations. And uh, Danielle, Wendy Rogers came out on top in a three-way mm -hmm. GOP primary. Yeah. Who is Wendy Rogers? So uh, Wendy Rogers is a four-time congressional candidate. She's an Air Force veteran. And you know, I keep saying this phrase, 
far to the right, but I think that it applies to Wendy Rogers as far as uh, the people that came out on top in the primary, perhaps more than the others we've talked about tonight. She's very far to the right. She's very uh, aligned with Trump. She's been calling herself a Trump candidate, and she's already been running, um, you know, attacks against her opponent in the general, and, she, you know, she's even been having, uh, she tweeted some photos that was a photo of her opponent next to some photos of ISIS, and so she's really going at it uh, full force already. And Joe, she's running against incumbent Democrat Tom O'Halloran, uh, and you're familiar with both Southern Arizona politics and Northern Arizona politics. What do, what do you see as the issues in this race? Well, Tom is an interesting kind of person to talk about because he used to be a Republican. He used to be in the state. He was well-liked, and he was pushed out when we had the Tea Party movement. He left the party. He reorganized and was asked by the Democrats to run for Congress. And so now we have a moderate Democrat that's up in Flagstaff that knows that area and knows CD1 very well and has the support of the Democratic Party. But he's running on a race and he's asking constantly for money, saying that he's under threat, the Republicans are trying to take his seat away from him, and he's leveraging it for more campaign cash as he heads into this race against Wendy Rogers, who I think really pivoted to embrace Trump versus her other campaigns that she's done in the last two years, the last four years. And uh, let's shift to the governor's race. Uh, Danielle David Car Garcia beat two Southern Arizona Democrats, mm -hmm. uh, Steve Farley and Kelly Fryer. Yeah. Uh, you got a chance to talk to both of them on election night. What did they have to say? Yeah, so I did speak with that. Well, I spoke with Steve Farley, and Kelly Fryer took the stage at the event that I was covering uh, before the results came in. And Steve Farley was, he was feeling really confident. He felt like he was the best candidate for the position. But he also uh, gave a speech about unity. He called Kelly Fryer onto the stage with him and basically said it doesn't matter who wins. The important thing is that we get a Democrat into the governor's office in the fall. So it was really a message of unity. But like I said, that was before the results came in. Um, so I, I'm sure he was disappointed that he wasn't the candidate. And, and Joe, who is David Garcia, our Democratic candidate? He's a lot of things. He's a veteran. He's an educator. But he also is known as the guy that lost to Diane Douglas in 2014 by a narrow margin. And, same the, and woman, the state superintendent of public instruction, right? Right, and the same woman who now has been lost in her own primary. So it's not something that, you know, helps as he goes into this race. He's well known throughout the state for that run, but he's tied to education. And with the defeat of Red for Ed recently, it's unclear how that's going to help him or hurt him as we move forward against somebody like Doug Ducey who's shown that he can raise money, that he's well known in the community. It's going to be an interesting kind of race to see how David Garcia is defined by what's going on right now. And Garcia was running out of money in this primary and Doug Ducey's going to have ten million dollars if he wants it. So that's going to be a big challenge for him. It is. So we'll see if Democrats, you know, put money back into this race. I think there's a lot of people that are mad about Red for Ed. So we could see, you know, a sea change moment right now happening before us, but it'd be weeks before those kind of numbers are reported. And uh, let's talk about some of the local legislative races uh, in the House race for Legislative District 10, which is central Tucson, uh, kind of south of Speedway Boulevard. Um, uh, we had a four-way primary battle. Uh, Danielle, who came out on top here? So Kirsten Engel, who's the incumbent, she had about twice as many votes as the other four candidates. So she's definitely in there. The other three, uh, you know, they're still counting votes. So uh, it's not for sure, but Domingo de Grazia is on top as of now. He has a few hundred votes more than either of his opponents. And Domingo de Grazia, you know, his name has some recognition because he's the son of the artist Ted de Grazia. He's a local lawyer. He's a musician. And um, his two, the other two candidates, Catherine Ripley and Mickey Lee, they're both veterans and all three of them are political newcomers. So we'll see who goes to the general with Kirsten Engel. And Joe, this is one of Arizona's few really competitive districts. In fact, it's got split representation right now with Kirsten Angle and uh, Todd Felter, a Republican in this race. Democrats are obviously hoping to take that seat back this time out. How do you how do you see that race shaping up? I think there's a lot of organization against Claude Felter. 
He certainly had a lot of his share of bad headlines over the last year, and so I think Democrats are really focusing on this race in terms of making sure that LD10 is now a full blue representation come November. So I expect there to be ads, I expect there to be it, all sorts of different ways of trying to make sure that they rally and get the Dems out to vote come November. And there's a big flap over the Confederate flag for Claude Felter. We had a screensaver on his computer, and uh, there were some Democrats who complained about this. Yes, and also his, his gun stance has really hurt him in that district a little bit. I've seen a lot of people complain about that as well on the ground. Danielle, Legislative District 9, which is the other side of Speedway Boulevard, and then kind of stretching up into the Catalina foothills over to the yeah. Casas Adobes area. A three-way race with two incumbents, Randy Fries and Pamela Powers Hanley, uh, came out on top over challenger J.P. Martin, but they still need to face Republican Anna Henderson in the general. Yes, that's right. So they easily won in the primary. Uh, J.P. Martin didn't do very well. Uh, they took the stage that night and basically just said they're ready for the general. General. They uh, have beat Ann Henderson before, and they feel pretty confident that they'll be able to do so again. Uh, Joe, it appears that Bobby Wilson, uh, you were the one who broke the news uh, that he killed his mom and that he kind of proudly announced that at a uh, Moms Demand Action Forum. You had the video on that that I think went pretty viral. Congratulations on that. Uh, he did not prevail in his race against Shelley Kice in the GOP primary. Came close. Uh, yeah, I want to say 48% of the vote went to Bobby, so I don't know if I helped him or hurt him in, in terms of writing about that, but a lot of people really, you know, backed him in that race, but it was a bit of a nail-biter at the beginning of the night. And are you among the journalists that Bobby Wilson is planning on suing? Bobby Wilson has touted my previous reporting. He proudly shared my story with all of his supporters, so I'm not terribly concerned about it, but he's did a 180 in terms of one day deciding that everything was fake news. Ah, uh, well, we may, you may have to lawyer up. We will I, wait and see. I read the book, so I'm, I feel pretty strong. Uh, <laughs> Shel uh, Shelly Kice will now go up against Democratic Andrea Del Democrat Andrea D'Alessandro in a district that does lean Democrat. It does. I think that that's my hometown, Green Valley. I, I think that we did have uh, Ackerley, who t got a seat two years ago, but we'll see what happens. Um, it's been solidly Democratic for a number of years. Mm, Danielle, as you mentioned, they are still counting votes, so it's not over yet. But it yeah. appears that Olivia Caro Bedford may have been knocked out after decades of uh, right. serving in the Arizona legislature, and she lost to some young punks. Yeah, so um, LD3, Olivia Caro Bedford, has been in that district going back and forth between the House and the Senate, I think, for close to 20 years. And yeah, she it seems like she's going to be beat by two people who aren't even 30, uh, Andres Khan and Alma Hernandez and they're yeah they seem to be up-and-coming stars in the Democratic local Democratic Party uh, Andre Canos has some recognition for working for a uh, uh, Pima County Supervisor Richard Elias, uh, Alma Hernandez, she's been an activist in the immigrant community, uh, she's also Jewish and has been very active in that community. So yeah, we'll see when they're done counting the votes, but that's the way it's looking. But that could be a new dynasty replacing an old one. Right, yes, I forgot about that, of course. Alma Hernandez is the sister of Daniel Hernandez, who is a state lawmaker and who became well known after helping save Gabby Gifford's life. And Joe, there's a third Hernandez uh, running for the school board. We'll see what happens in that race. My colleague Hank, D Hank Stevenson has probably got more information on, on this race. I, I only watch from afar, but it could be a brand new political dynasty down here in Tucson starting right before our eyes. Uh, a big loss on uh, Tuesday night for Keith B. the second, the 21-year-old uh, who was running for a, a seat on the Justice Court as a Justice of the Peace, uh, Danielle, and the hope to capitalize, I think, on his dad's name idea. Yeah, it seemed like that's what was happening, and uh, we had one of our reporters covering that, trying to get a hold of him, trying to ask him why he didn't have any photos on his campaign material, why he wasn't making it clear that he was not actually his father, but a 21-year-old with no experience. So maybe the voters read our reporting and decided that they actually might want somebody with a little experience in there. 
And uh, speaking of name games, uh, we learned today uh, that Luis Gonzalez, who is on the Pima Community College Board, is not going to run for re-election again. Right. But there's someone else named Luis Gonzalez who's friends with the Luis Gonzalez who's right. also now running. Yes, so the Luis Gonzalez who is going to run is actually the husband of Sally Ann Gonzalez who just won her race in LD3 or it looks like she's going to win once the votes are done being counted. Um, and uh, yeah, those two are actually friends. They go way back. Uh, I actually just spoke with Luis Gonzalez who is sitting in that seat right now not Sally Ann's husband, but the other Luis Gonzalez. It gets complicated. Right before I came here, I spoke with him, and he said, basically, you know, I asked him, are you, do you guys think that voters are gonna get confused and not know which Luis Gonzalez they're voting for? And he said, no, he's not worried about it. He thinks that the voters are smart enough to do their homework, and once the incoming, perhaps, Luis Gonzalez starts campaigning, they'll see his photos and they'll know it's a different Luis Gonzalez, so. Yeah. Hay muchas we'll Luis Gonzalez en la ciudad. <laughs> uh, Danielle, uh, we have two initiatives knocked off the ballot this week. One was the Invest in Ed initiative that you spent a lot of time covering that would increase income taxes yeah. to uh, on Arizona's highest earners to pay for education programs. Uh, they concluded the ballot language was wrong. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, I think a lot of people are going to be very upset about that. That was something that the the People that were involved in Red Fred worked really hard to get enough signatures to get that on the ballot. So we'll see. I think that 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 the people that were behind Invest in Ed are already super energized. So I don't even know if I could say this will energize them more. Um, but I think people are going to be really upset about it, and we'll see if it if it energizes more Democrats to vote for people who they think are going to support more education funding. Joe, any kind of impact you well, see? Well, I kind of wonder if it's just going to be Democrats. I mean, this is something that we saw span more than just partisanship. That's true. It's I, I kind of wonder if this is going to prompt independents and moderate Republicans to think about this as they yeah, go to the polls and decide how they're going to vote for state legislator, governor, things of that nature. Yeah. Do you think it would have been advantageous for Republicans to have a tax can uh, increase to campaign against? It's true, but I, I fully expect that when you ask what it's for, we talk about education, the, the conversation changes pretty quickly. It's not about tax, it's about education as far as those conversations seem to go and where the momentum is when I look online, when I talk to people. Uh, there's the other initiative, Joe, that didn't make it was an effort to require more disclosure of campaign contributions from these so-called dark money groups. Former Attorney General Terry Goddard was involved in this one. It, it was just a matter of not having enough signatures. It really is. I mean, I, it, it's unfortunate, but, you know, when we look at calculations about turning in signatures, it's always about having the padding to make sure that you can survive a challenge like this. And they just barely squeaked over the minimum amount to turn in. And, you know, a, a challenge was almost inevitable. It's unfortunate because, you know, from my vantage point, it probably would have passed. And they make it uh, a l little tougher these days to get an initiative on the ballot thanks to some changes in state law a couple years ago. They've made it harder, and they make it harder to fight it in court. Subpoenaing all the people that signed it is a monumental task, and there's no guarantee that they're going to come to court even with being subpoenaed. And there is uh, there is still an, one initiative, uh, or a couple initiatives still going on the ballot. One, sure. one was, uh, involves clean energy and, uh, and requiring more renewable energy in Arizona. And that's a big fight. It's got a lot of backers behind it. We're going to see where that goes. I mean, it falls in line with how important the Corporation Commission election is that we haven't talked about yet. Oh, that's right. We should talk about the Corporation Commission election. That, that was a big win for former Democrat Rodney Glassman, as well as uh, a current sitting uh, Commissioner Justin Olson. And the loss of a current Commissioner who is no longer in the race. Right. Got Tom Forsey, Forsey. who, who uh, went down on that one. Is this something you think APS is going to be worried about? I mean, I think both Glassman and Olson seem to be leaning towards supporting Bob Burns in terms of some of these subpoenas that he wants about how APS was spending money to influence these elections. You, you, you think APS has something to be worried about now? 
we'll find out when the ads start hitting in a couple of weeks. But I mean, there's certainly a lot of discussion there. I think that there is some changes coming for the Corporation Commission. We'll see how good APS is and good at influencing them next year. All right. Well, we're going to leave it there. Thank you to uh, Joe Ferguson from the Arizona Daily Star, Danielle Kamara from the Tucson Weekly and Tucson Local Media talking about how the dust is settling in this week's primary election. Uh, that is our show for today. My thanks to our media partners at Tucson Weekly, Inside Tucson Business, Tucson Local Media, Creative Tucson, and Community Radio, KXCI 91.3 FM, where you can hear a radio version of Zona Politics at 5 p.m. on Sunday afternoons. We have a lot of media partners. I'm Jim Ninsel. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Zona Politics is made possible with the generous support of The Loft Cinema, Tucson's independent movie theater. The Loft features independent foreign and documentary films, cult classics, discussions with filmmakers, and much more, including The Loft Film Fest in November. The Loft is located at 3233 East Speedway Boulevard. Showtimes can be found at loftcinema.org. Support for Zona Politics is provided by Hotel Congress in historic downtown Tucson. More information at hotelcongress.com and 622-8848. The Tucson Hispanic Chamber of Commerce serves the business community in the bilingual, biculture region of the Arizona-Sonora border and is a proud media partner with Zona Politics. Learn more at tucsonhispanicchamber.org. young people from the community come together, actually like get up and do something. We can do anything! I think we've attracted like a lot of people that are like super passionate. Uh, we're here at the No Ban, No Wall protest. If you come out of college, you have this experience, you know how things run, you have a huge leg up. People who have ideas and who are, who are dreamers, you know what I mean, who really want to get themselves out there, I think that they should come here. Zona Politics is hosted by Tucson Weekly senior writer Jim Ninsel. The program is produced by Jennifer Powers Murphy and Danny Vinnick and edited by Jim Rundle. Special thanks to KXCI, Tucson Weekly, Brink Creative Digital, and all supporters who provide crucial funding for the program. Learn more about Zona Politics at zonapolitics.com and be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter.